Welcome to the Online Bodyguard Podcast with host Philip Rendell, CEO and founder of Diffuse, a global threat and intelligence consultancy that blends psychology and intelligence to mitigate threats and risks to prominent people and brands. So hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Online Bodyguard. Today, I, I'm absolutely thrilled because I've got a special guest and a, and a lady who I hope I can call a friend because we've known each other for a few years now through horrendous circumstances that, that neither of us would ever want on anybody. Today's guest is Kim Ledbeater. She's the Labour Member of Parliament for Batley and Spen. She's doing that job because arguably her sister, who was the previous MB, or the previous MB but one, um, was killed doing that job. And had that not happened, I doubt Kim would ever be doing this job because you had a very different life in, let's say, 2015 when you were, you know, when your sister was an MP and you were just doing your own thing. You know, what were you doing before all this happened? What, what was your life like then, sort of, you know, 2015? Yeah, thank you, Philip. So um, it's lovely to be here on your show. And I am very happy to call you a friend. And you've been a good friend to me over recent years. So yeah, I mean, I suppose, prior to Joe's murder, I had um, what you might call a normal life, but then hey, what's normal. But I had done various things with my career. I'd started my career in the private sector, working in sales, selling beds of all things. And then I went back to university and um, followed my real passion, actually, which was working in physical activity and health and well-being. So that's what my degree was in. Um, I ran my own business working as a personal trainer and a group exercise instructor and doing kind of, even though it sounds a bit cheesy, life coaching stuff with people who were struggling with physical, mental health and well-being. But then I was also a lecturer. So I worked at two local colleges teaching in that subject area, sport, physical activity, health, well-being. Um, and as you say, I was very happy with my lot. I was about to actually leave my teaching career and go on to do my master's degree, something which Joe, my sister, was very supportive of. Joe was one of these people who would always say, you should be doing more. You should be challenging yourself. You should be pushing yourself. And she always felt that, you know, I, I could have done more with my career, even though I was actually very happy doing what I did. So I was just about to do my master's degree. And then um, in June 2016, Joe was killed and everything changed forever. Indeed, yeah, and we'll, we'll come to that in, in a moment. I mean, what was your childhood like? Because you, you, you know, from what we, I mean, I never knew Joe. I mean, I, you know, I never had the honour or the pleasure of knowing her, but I, I know her legacy. And and knowing you, you know, you're one of the most positive, bubbly people I know. Um, I'm sure she was probably the same. So, what was your childhood like? How did you, you know, you you've got sort of values that are strong values around inclusion and and kindness and those sort of things. And and I know that your sister had the same. So. Where does that all come from? I think fundamentally that comes from our parents. We were blessed with two loving parents who supported us, cared for us, nurtured us and empowered us. And as a result of that, and a wider family network, which was also pretty good, um, and lots of friends and each other. Joe and I were very close. I think because of that um, setup, we were really... Um, blessed with lots of good role models we were in we had instilled in us a core set you're quite right of values and beliefs nothing fancy um you know but things like treating other people how you wish to be treated working on compromising on things when you needed to um you know just treating everybody around you with respect and understanding and empathy and celebrating the differences that there were between different human beings not seeing those differences as a negative thing at all and we were sort of, we had instilled in us this sense of inquisitiveness as well. So we always want to know about other people. We're interested in finding out about other people. And you're right, deep compassion for other people. And I think that came from my parents. And But they didn't talk about those things. I think it was just that that's how mum and dad were. That's how our family was. And that was just how you treated other people. And Joe and I were very close. We were best mates, really, despite sort of two school years between us. We did everything together when we were kids, whether it was dancing or going out on our bmx bikes or whatever it would be and that security of that family unit i think was really important and i've come to be even more grateful for that as i've grown older and certainly since joe was killed and and also realized that not everybody's lucky enough to have that and i think that start in life does make a huge difference to where you where you go with your life and, and 
you know, you, you, you're the MP for an area where you grew up effectively. So it's, it's a place that you obviously have grown up in. You know it as you said, you, you know everything about it probably better than anybody, certainly better than other people that have tried to stand for the election there. It's a multicultural area. So, and it's been multicultural probably all your life, certainly. So does that play a big part then in, because you've grown up in a multicultural area where it's just the norm to you, does that play a big part in some of those values that, that exist? I think it does. Um, having said that, the area is much more diverse now than it was when we were kids. Um, but I think because my dad worked in Leeds, which is not that far away at all, but in that day it felt like a long way away, but he met with lots of people from lots of different backgrounds through his work. My mum worked at the local primary school, so had kids there from, from different backgrounds and things. So we were around people um, who didn't always look like us, um, and we had opportunities to go, like my dad's work had a place in London, so we went to London, um, and then it was just as holidays abroad were starting to become fashionable, so we would do the old coach trip to Spain and stuff. And So I, I guess we had opportunities to meet people from different backgrounds in a, a way that influenced our views and things on people. But I also think part of it was just that even though my mum and dad came from very traditional working-class backgrounds, the values that they had um, around how you treat other people had clearly been passed on. Like that, that both sets of my grandparents were just genuinely really nice people. So I, I don't know how far you would have to go back to see where that came from. But certainly um, I feel that a lot of how I view the world comes from that childhood. Okay. So, I, I mean, I, you know, listen, I, I think it's a kind of unfortunate um label sometimes when oh yeah you know kim she's joe cox's sister and i, and I don't want to really focus on what happened to your sister because i think so much has been talked about around that and and i don't want to kind of focus on that what i want to focus on is you and and you know you you, you come from a, as i say a background that was not political you weren't had any you know intention of getting in this involved but clearly you had a sister who was involved so you must have had some insight into her experiences initially of let's be honest, the hostility of being a member of parliament. What do you remember being that those kind of conversations being? I think going back to um, identity, this is one of the, the very strange things that happened to me after Joe was killed. I'd always been very confident in my own identity. I was always Kim Leadbeater. That's who I was. Joe was always Joe. And then you're quite right. So sort of, I suddenly became Joe Cox's sister. But I've got no problem with that whatsoever, because that's a very, very proud part of my identity. And I'm I'm perfectly happy being referred to in that way. Um, I think the biggest the bigger issue for me around identity when Joe was killed was that I suddenly became an only child mm. because there was only me and Joe. Mm. And I've talked about our childhood. I've talked about how close we were. And that was a really, really difficult thing for me to to get my head around and I still haven't if I'm if I'm quite honest but in terms of being Joe's sister I've got no problem with that at all and people will still say that less so now I have to say and I think it was important to me in this job that I did carve out my own identity and I and, you know I do think I'm doing that and I think I've done that um, but ultimately my story is my story mm. the reason I am doing this job you're quite right is because my sister was murdered mm. you know and, and I, I own that I, I have to you know be honest about that Having said that, I was always very interested in politics. And bizarrely, at primary school, a couple of the teachers said, because I was always pretty confident as a kid, like, oh, she'll be prime minister one day. <laughs> um, and, and by contrast, Joe was very shy. But actually, that made what Joe went on to achieve even more impressive as far as I'm concerned, because she actually really had to work on building her confidence, which she did over a number of years. Um, so even though I am still, I guess, out of my comfort zone in terms of where I saw my life going, what I've also learned, and this was by watching Joe do the job, was that politics is about people. Everything that happens in Parliament, in Westminster, um, affects people up and down the country. And I feel really passionately that we need good people in politics. Mm. That's something else that Joe would say to me a lot when we were sort of taking the mickey out of her. She said, but if, if good people don't put themselves forward, then Kim, what do you end up with? And she's quite right. Mm. So I think even though I've had to reconcile what my life looks like now in lots of different ways, I've got to keep reminding myself that I am here for the right reasons. Mm. Um, and you're quite right, my ambitions weren't to be an MP. I didn't have 20 years of my life thinking, how am I going to get into Parliament? Far from it. 
But now I'm here, I'm determined that I'm going to make as much of a positive difference as I possibly can, even though the route that I got here was the most horrific one you can imagine. What do you remember about, you know, about Joe talking about her experience as an MP in terms of the the hostility that, that MPs are receiving constantly? Well, interestingly, I don't think it was anywhere near as bad in 2015 when Joe got elected as it has gone on to be since. Um, I remember Joe would get the odd, not particularly pleasant email, um, but, but often that was related to something that maybe she'd done politically, um, particularly on big international issues. But I don't remember her... She never felt scared, to my knowledge. She never, you know, felt that she was in any sort of danger. And I and I do and I, from what I can remember at that time, the climate wasn't like that. But unfortunately, then things changed. And when we were leading up to the Brexit referendum, I think that was a real turning point for the political atmosphere. And I think, unfortunately, since Joe's murder, we've seen things get progressively worse. However, I know that politics has always been you know, a tough business to be in. You know, you can look back historically to when people were getting things thrown at them in the streets and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's not like it's new for politicians to be attacked in some way or another. But I think there's so many factors in recent years that have made things become much more toxic and have made politicians targets, which also actually is the responsibility of politicians as well. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's fair to expect people to feel sorry for us as MPs. We've got a very privileged uh, job, but and I think we have to look at our responsibility um, as to how we can make the political culture a safer place to be, but a more pleasant place to be as well. Right? And I do think it's perfectly feasible to have passionate, robust political debate and to disagree on things, but to do that in a civilized manner. And I think we've lost sight of that in recent years. So, looking back from you know, now back to sort of 2015 when you were, or to early 2016 when you were, you know doing what you were doing. How has your life changed? Well, it's changed beyond recognition. I mean, being an MP, if you do it properly, is a ridiculously full-on job. You could literally do 24-7, seven days a week, and still feel like you've not scratched the surface. Um, the range of issues and subjects that you get involved with, um, that you are expected to know about, that you want to know about, is vast. Being a really, really good constituency MP and being a really, really good parliamentary Westminster MP, I think, is a, is a constant battle for me because, as you said earlier, I'm from the area I represent. I know each town and village well. I know the issues that there are. I want to help people there. But then equally, you want to make your mark in Westminster and ultimately you want to change um, the vision for the country, which as an opposition MP is all about trying to win the next general election and trying to carve out what the country could look like under your party's leadership so doing that is really hard um i get very very little spare time i mean there's no spare time social time is extremely limited time with family friends um but then equally i'm my own worst enemy so i say yes to everything <laughs> i want to do everything i want to be involved in everything i get very excited about everything as my team will tell you so i've got to kind of look at how i can rein myself in a little bit which is part of the problem but the other thing, really important thing to point out in this job is that you're nothing without your team. Mm -hmm. And I am so fortunate to have a really, really strong staff team who work extremely hard, support me extremely well when it comes to everything. Um, that's not just getting the work done. It's about safety, security and, you know, moral support as well, emotional mm -hmm. support yeah. and everything else in between. So my life now looks very different. I guess what I had in between was the transition from what was my life before Joe was murdered. And I do sort of chunk my life out in these ways. Then there was the period of time after Joe was killed um, up to becoming an MP, which was largely working for the Joe Cox Foundation, the charity that we set up in Joe's name. And that was also an extremely busy time. Um, and I think one of my ways of coping with my loss was just to get my head down and try and do as much positive stuff as possible. And initially that was very much through Joe's foundation. Um and, and what you don't have in this job is any time to reflect. And whilst I think that is actually a good thing in some ways, because if I start to think about what's happened to my life, I'm not sure where I would go with it. Um, but it's also a bad thing because you don't have time to think about, you know, what am I actually achieving? What difference am I actually making? So it's a, yeah, it's a bit of a, a mixed bag, really, of being busy, which is a good thing, but also being excessively busy, which sometimes can be a bad thing, too. And 
how safe do you feel then as an MP, as a public figure? Generally, I feel safe. Um, but one of the reasons for that is because I've taken all the advice that I've been given from yourself um, and from the police, be that in West Yorkshire, and the West Yorkshire police have been absolutely fantastic, be that from the parliamentary authorities team um, in Westminster. I've taken all the advice on board. And why wouldn't I? And why wouldn't anyone, in all fairness? Um, and I'm careful. You know, I got a load of grief recently for saying on in a uh, TV interview that, you know, I don't do open surgeries. Well, not many MPs do open surgeries anymore. And what we mean by an open surgery is you don't put yourself in a room where anybody can walk through the door, which actually in light of the fact that we've now had two MPs murdered and various other MPs physically attacked and assaulted, then why... Why the heck would you do that? And actually, it's the, it's not a very efficient way of doing business anyway. There's far more um, efficient ways of helping people who, who need your help. Um, so generally, I feel I feel fine. But I've had so many conversations with MPs who have had huge amounts of abuse, be that via social media, be that via email, be that via people turning up at their offices, um, that you always are aware that there is that underlying level of you know, this this isn't a normal life anymore. You know, you are a target in, in some respect. So that never really leaves you. And so, I mean, presumably, you, like many MPs, you, you kind of travel up and down the country to your constituency and back to Parliament. Do you, have, have you got used to being recognised now? Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? So I, like, I mean, I'm not that recognisable. I suppose I am in the constituency because, obviously, all the work that we did um, through Joe's Foundation, we did a lot of stuff at a local level. I guess you get recognised a little bit in London, but not too much. Um, and that is weird. <laughs> I don't think I particularly like it, but I also don't mind it. Because generally, most people are lovely and most people come up and say nice things. And, and, and that's great. I don't mind that at all. Um, it must be weird being a really sort of famous MP, like, you know, one of the one of the um, main people in government and what have you. Um but yeah, it's it's a weird phenom- phenomenon. Um, would, would would that would that stop you having an ambition? You know that that desire, I suppose, or that 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 reflection on enjoying the privacy and the and the the ability to just almost carry on some degree of normality. Would that prevent you then having the ambition to be a cabinet minister? I think it is something I think about. Yeah, it is something I think about because. Bizarrely, I was always quite a private person, a very confident person, a very sociable person, but I really liked, you know, having my private life as well. And we used to say that to Joe. We, me and my mum and dad and my partner would say, you know, we, we'll help you, we'll support you, we'll pick the kids up, we'll run around after you and all the rest of it, but we don't really want anyone to know who we are. We're quite happy with our lives as it is. Um, and then obviously all that changed. But yeah, I think having a high profile where, you, you know, you literally can't walk down the street with people recognising you, whether that's in a good way or in a bad way, is weird, isn't it? I mean, fame full stop is weird, you know, whether that's a celebrity or sports person or a politician, find it all quite bizarre. Um, but it but it is something I'm aware of. And and people talk about, you know, in this job, but in, in lots of jobs, about raising your profile. And I have said repeatedly to my team, I don't want to raise my profile. Yeah. I actually want a lower profile, <laughs> if anything. Um, but then inevitably, if you want to get stuff done, part of that is about, being out there and showing people what you're doing. Mm. So it's yeah, I, I find that a bit of a, a bit of a tricky one. So when you talk about when you talk to colleagues then and they talk about you know how they feel safe wise and, and and whether they are getting threats and abuse, what what what's the kind of conversations that do go on? Is it? I mean, there's I know and you know you know a, a female MP has a very different experience to a male MP as an example. Um. Yeah. And I think a female females generally have very different experiences to males, so it's kind of replicated in, and probably exaggerated because of the circumstances you're in. But you know, you touched on it a moment ago about you know some of the other people uh, talk about their experiences. What sort of things are they saying? What's what's the sort of mood at the moment within Parliament? So we've done quite a bit of work through the Joe Cox Foundation around safety in public life and more broadly around civility in public life. So I'd already interviewed quite a few MPs about abuse and um, levels of intimidation and things like that. So I knew it was a problem. Um, And that was actually across the political spectrum, 
men and women, but you're quite right, women are far more disproportionately affected uh, by abuse, as are uh, women, particularly from uh, black and ethnic minority backgrounds. Um, so I knew it was a problem. I'd also made a little a little documentary with ITV about about not just about MPs actually. This was it was called Angry Britain. So it was about hostility and abuse towards other people, um, some in public life, celebrities as well, but also online against just normal everyday people. Um, but then when I came into Parliament and I started chatting to again particularly female colleagues, what really alarmed me was the way that they would just reel off court cases, restraining orders people in prison, as though it was a shopping list, as though it was perfectly normal. And some colleagues in particular, people like Jess Phillips, people like Nash Shah, who have had huge amounts of abuse um, for putting their head above the parapet on, on certain issues. And that really alarmed me that it had become so normalised. Mm. And, and again, it wasn't just female MPs. So I, I made a, a piece of work for, for Channel 4 Dispatchers programme and we interviewed and I consciously made the effort to interview people A, across the political spectrum, B, men and women and um, C, with you know very different views on very different range of subjects and even somebody like Peter Bone, who's an MP who I've probably got very, very different views with on lots of subjects, has had a horrendous time with death threats to, to his son. So, the, you know, this is a problem per se, but then within that there are certainly um, specific issues around women and the abuse that women face. I mean, I, I, again, speaking on a, a cross-party basis, people like Caroline Noakes, who's had huge amounts of abuse, you know, it, it's a problem. And, and I think that the question is, what do we do about that? And that's one of the things that I'm sort of trying to work on um, through this job now. And it's multifaceted. And I do think, as I said before, part of that is how we behave. And I think standards in public life are really important and, and sometimes not where they should be. Mm. It's difficult, isn't it? Because, because <clears throat> you know, you're a public figure and politics is increasingly hostile. Um, you know, the divisions between arguably the right and the left are probably a as great as they have been for some time, although perhaps not quite so bad as they were maybe two or three years ago. And so... Um, the public feel it right now, and you know there'll be. I I know when I was when I first went into Parliament, you know, shortly after your your sister's murder, many of the MPs. I mean, we increased reporting by four hundred percent. So from when I first went in to when I kind of, I suppose, well, it was actually within probably eighteen months, reporting had gone up four hundred percent because, as you said, many MPs just thought being abused was part of the job. Now, understandably, after your sister's death, and then and then after the threat to Rosie and and, and what have you, then I know they know after David as well, we got spikes, where all of a sudden we get a lot more reports. You you said I've taken all the advice I've I've been given, and of course you've got a huge incentive to do that. But the frustration when I was there was so many MPs would talk about it, but wouldn't take the advice. They wouldn't have the security measures that where they were entitled to. Um. How do we how do we break that 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 chain then of of you know there is lots of money being spent there's lots of advice out there and yet still plenty of MPs are still quite vulnerable. I think it's a really challenging um, problem. I think ultimately you've got 650 MPs, 650 individuals who are essentially little self-employed businesses. That's something that people probably don't realise. So when you get this job. You get given a budget, you you get sent off to go set your office up in your constituency, set your office up in Parliament, employ some staff. So you're this little entity. And no one really talks to you in huge amounts of detail about security and safety and what that might look like um, on any sort of consistent basis. But also you're bringing into that job your own feelings about safety and security. Now, for me, obviously, that was paramount, really, to A, deciding to put myself forward and B, the decisions that I make as I do the job. But you've got MPs who've been here for, you know, decades who lived in a very different world and probably think, well, what's all the fuss about? Not, not Nothing would happen. Um, and you've then got other MPs, if I'm honest, who think that they are the bee's knees and are the most important person in, in the world and they want to be looked after 24-7 with a personal bodyguard, you know. Um, so, so the challenge for anybody who's trying to address the issue of safety and security when it comes to actually working with MPs is, out of those 650 individuals, you've got 650 different conversations 
And that means having a structured approach is very difficult. Um, and also because you're your own boss, no one can really tell you that you have to have this training or you have to have this. I mean, I think safety and security training should be compulsory when you come in. I think you should have your staff trained in that regard as well. I think you should have a member of staff who is given the support to take care of your safety and security. They should be paid to do that job because they're not. And the reality there is you've got a lot of very young staff members who take responsibility for these issues without any support or any training. And they're making decisions, you know, particularly when email's coming or when you see stuff on social media, they're, they're measuring the threat level and they've had no training to do it. Mm. And that's totally and utterly wrong. Mm. So the system needs to change. Part of that is ensuring that MPs appreciate how important this is. And I think some probably like me do, and some, quite frankly, don't. Um, you've then got the challenge of what the job looks like, as you've sort of alluded to. So we spend half our time in Westminster. We spend half our time in a constituency. We spend a lot of time travelling. How do you possibly manage that piece of safety and security work when it's such a bonkers job and you're here, there and everywhere? And primarily, part of your job, the biggest part of your job, should be reaching out and working with your constituents. So you want to be in public. You want to be out there chatting to people. But that has its own dangers with it. So it's, it is a real challenge. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of good work has been done. But if I'm honest, I do think there's more work to do. It's a constant process. And it's a constant process because even with the best will in the world, training somebody once is insufficient. They need, you know, reviews and refreshers and constant, you know, support, what have you, as you said. And 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 it's, you know, it, it, you're absolutely right. It's a huge challenge because everyone has a different, well, everyone has a different level of perceived threat actually arguably everyone's at the same threat if you, if you look at the 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 kind of methodology of how people are targeted but people feel differently people assume if you're more high profile you're more at risk that isn't actually true and we know that because you know no one would have put your sister or rosie or david or any of those people Stephen and others on any high risk list um so it can, you know my argument was always this can happen to anybody so you've all got to be careful but of course that's not that's not what happens but then we move on to the next bit, which is, you know, we're coming up to a general election in the next, I don't know, 18 months or so. And across the country, we're going to get, you know, you will become candidates again. You stop being members of parliament, you become candidates. And actually, automatically, what happens is you no longer get the support of parliament. And you get lots of candidates who are being sent out to to campaign on their own and... and um, and some of them will be brand new. They're not in politics. They're, they're, they're brand new. Others will be seasoned politicians. And I don't think they get sufficient support and sufficient um, security help and advice and safety help and advice around, you know, you're walking down a dark street at night. You've got no idea whose door you're knocking on. No one even knows you're there probably. That's got to be something that, that's got to be corrected between now and the time when that next election is called. I agree. However, one of the big problems you've got is who's going to pay for that? Absolutely, yeah. Because ultimately, if you try and convince taxpayers that it's really important that political candidates and you know potential MPs are, are looked after and their safety and security is, is taken care of at the expense of other things, then that's a really, really difficult argument to make. Mm. Um, and, and the worrying thing there is that now that we're having much more of a conversation about safety and security in public life, which I think is a very good thing, my worry is that it will put people off wanting to put themselves forward, particularly women, particularly young women, because why would you? You see the abuse that, that people get and you see the threats that, that are made and, and, and all that. And think, why would you bother? And also we will lose good people from public life. I mean, certainly in the 2019 election, several MPs, it wasn't the reason for stepping down, but it was certainly a factor in that they just had enough. Um, so, I think you're right. I think more needs to be done. But what does that look like and how is it funded? And uh, they're, they're really challenging questions. Um, because I think the other thing as well is thinking about, you know, we talk a lot about the MP or the candidate or whatever, but around that MP is family, there's friends, there's staff. And so the threat isn't just towards that individual. It's also to the, the broader um, network of people around them. And that that that's upsetting because mm. sometimes you'll get MPs who are like, look, I don't mind, say what you want about me, but it's family and friends that have to watch that happen. And that's really, really unpleasant and upsetting. And also, you know, my experience was, that's all very well saying that, but everyone's got a tipping point. 
however robust and resilient you are, there comes a point where enough's enough. You know, and I, I dealt with a couple, you know, I'm not going to mention names, but I dealt with one or two MPs who anyone who you would would take a straw poll would say that person's a hugely resilient person. And yet I was having them in my office, you know, breaking down, um, clearly terrified about what's going to happen. So, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm as critical as anyone of the of the standard of some of our MPs. But if we want better MPs, then we've got to encourage them by way of, as you said, ensuring that they feel safe to come into the job, that when they're in the job, they're, they're kept safe and they and they're not just kept safe, but they they feel safer. And I, it's a bit of a cliche because that's kind of my mantra. But but I, I, you know, one of my things when I was there was that you've got all this money being spent, you've got all these various things, but people still weren't feeling safe. Therefore, what we were doing wasn't working because unless you feel safe, you're not going to be as productive or as effective or, or you know, you're not going to want to go out on your own, you know, I, I remember talking to some MPs who were going some places and I said, well, who are you going with? I'm going on my own because it's an evening meeting. And I would say, yeah, we would never send a policeman on his own to that estate at night and you're going to walk in there on your own and assume everything's fine. So I think we do need an overhaul and I think we need to treat the security and the, and the safety of you guys significantly better than we do now. Yeah, and, and as the expert... I, I take that. <laughs> I take that on board fully. And, and I think it's also there's, there's different dimensions to your safety. There's, there's the physical safety that you feel um, when you go into places, and, and that's the area that, that you specialise in. But there's also that the online space. There's there's different layers to it. So, and and the impact it has on democracy when you've got elected people who don't feel safe. And I would include councillors within this as well because we often forget about local mm, councillors. Yeah, yeah. who You know, often <clears throat> huge amounts of abuse as well. So I think that thing about if I say this on social media, I know I'm going to get a load of abuse. That's a horrible way to feel about doing your job. But I think we all have that every day. Mm. And then your family and friends and staff have to watch that play out on social media. Um, so it does impact democracy. I know I've spoken to MP colleagues who have said, you know, when it comes to votes, they've had to really think about how they're going to vote. Not because it's how they think they should vote, but because they know the amount of abuse they will get if they vote a certain way. Mm. Now, that's deeply disturbing. Yeah. That that's going to impact on, on democracy. Um, and I, I honestly don't know what you do about that. Yeah, we saw quite a bit of that during Brexit. I, there was particular MPs who would say to me, I'm really worried about tonight's vote because, of course, you know, people may not realise, but all your voting is published so that we have an open, transparent democracy so everyone can see. And equally, you know, we would, you know, you, you know that, if you're going on question time or if you're going on the news or if you're going on, you know, Laura Kinsberg or whatever it is, whatever show, you are always going to, you know, you're the abuse and threats and the intimidation you get is going to spike. And people don't understand always the psychological impact on of that level of abuse and threats and that, that kind of tipping point. So it isn't just about are you physically safe? It's also about are you psychologically safe? Are you able to really take in the volume of information that you have to do and process it and, and you know, represent your, your constituency or the country, depending on who you are, um, with all that in the background. And that, that must be so challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because you want to use your energy, you want to use your headspace for doing the good stuff that this job enables you to do. You want to use it to help people and to champion causes that people care about, whether that's locally or nationally or internationally. But you're right, you're taking up a chunk of your brain every minute of every day thinking, Oh, is that the right thing to do? Is that a safe thing to do? Should I say that? Ooh, what will the backlash be if I do say that? I'll do that. And that's just wasting energy um, when you could be doing something much more positive and much more productive. And I think you're right about, about the, you know, we've got some amazingly strong people in politics and, and that's great, but there's only so much anybody can take when you are having horrible things said about you, you know. And and, and I guess that, that that's the, the layers to it as well, isn't there? There's the threats and the abuse. Um some of which is very dangerous, but some of it is just really horrible. <laughs> and when did we, when did we start being so nasty to our fellow human beings? And this isn't just MPs. I think this is a broader narrative in society. And this is something I've spoken about before. You know, whether it's celebrities or whether it's sports people or whether it's just other people that you come across on social media in particular, that it seems to be all right now to just say whatever you want. And how does this? How does this? How does this fit in then with? the Joe Cox Foundation and what you're doing with that? 
So we're, we're doing a piece of work. I say we're doing it. I'm unfortunately not involved in the foundation anymore because Joe's foundation is, is very much non-political and it's, it works across the political spectrum. Um, but they're doing a big piece of work called the Civility Commission, and it's looking at how we can encourage more civility in public life. That's within politics and more broadly around politics as well. And I think that is about looking at the standards that politicians set. It's looking at ways in which we can have those very important debates and discussions about controversial issues sometimes, but without that descending into abuse and threats and intimidation. So that's a really, really important piece of work um, within the political arena. But I also think, you know, the online safety bill is an important piece of legislation in terms of, you know, what does what does it look like to have um, a safe online space, but also I think a more respectful online space. But it's really difficult work because there's this concept of legal but harmful, you know, which which is one of the, the massive challenges of the online safety bill. So something might not cross the threshold of being illegal, but actually it might be deeply, deeply offensive. But then how do we define offensive? Because what I find offensive, you might be absolutely fine with. <clears throat> so these are really challenging concepts. And when we're looking at, you know, some of the controversial issues that, that are at the forefront of, of politics and society at the moment, it's really difficult. And, and, and how do you deal with that in the online space and indeed in the offline space? Um, so these are ongoing challenges, I would say. Mm. And it's interesting. One of the things I, I found when I was working in Parliament was – Coming from a law enforcement background and, and working in the sort of justice system, I suppose, my threshold for what was offensive was a lot higher than everyone else's. And I remember distinctly coming home one day and saying to my wife, oh, this happened today. And and my wife said, my God, that's awful. And I was like, is it? She said, yeah, God, if I had that, I'd be horrified. And I, I remember coming to work the next day and saying, you know, having this conversation and recognising that what was happening was that you know, politicians or members of public were saying to us, the police, I'm offended. And we were saying effectively, oh, no, you're not, because the law says you're not. Um, and that's got to be wrong if, if you know, the public are saying I'm offended and the, and the law says, no, you're not. No, it doesn't hit this threshold. You're not offended by it, you know. So that's got to be something that's got to be addressed. And I know that the online safety bill is supposed to do that, although it's been going on for years, hasn't it, really? So when we ever actually see it, who knows? I mean, do you think it's possible to end up with a safe internet? That's a big question, isn't it? Yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's, it's probably impossible to end up with a 100% safe internet and certainly 100% inoffensive internet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, largely because of, as we've said, so much of the subjectivity that's involved in that. But I think we can do a damn sight better than we're doing now. And I think, you know, the social media companies have got to take responsibility, they've got to step up. And, and this is across a range of issues. This isn't just about abuse in public life. This is really deeply disturbing issues like, you know, childhood pornography and abuse and um, suicide, self-harm. You know, we've had some deeply traumatic testimonies from people uh, when I was sitting on the Online Safety Bill Committee. You know, people whose children have committed suicide, people whose children have been groomed online. You know, these are really serious issues. And it's that kind of breadcrumbing where you might see one piece of information in isolation and think, well, that's not a problem. That's not offensive. But actually, the way that evil people online work is they will breadcrumb and they will lead on to deeper and darker and more disturbing and, and horrible things. So I think there's a lot more that can be done. And that the social media companies, it's their algorithms that make that happen. We've all seen it, haven't we? If you start researching, you know, cats, suddenly everything on your feed is about cats. So equally, if you start researching extremism or right-wing extremism even if it's just initially in a fairly innocent way suddenly that's all that pops up on your feed so and same with self-harm same with suicide um so i think there's a lot more that can be done and again it's good to have those conversations and not just start shouting at each other about freedom of speech because of course freedom of speech is a fundamental pillar of our democracy and i'd be the first one to defend it but we've also got to look at the dangers around that you know, freedom of speech narrative, which actually sometimes is just about the freedom to offend. Yeah. And I can't yeah. understand why anybody would, would want to defend that. Yeah. And so, you know, we see increasingly younger people being drawn into what effectively are terrorist organisations, be they extreme right wing, um, Islamic or otherwise. 
And you see, you know, young people going to prison for long sentences because it's terrorism legislation. Something's got to be wrong there in terms of these, they're often diff- disenfranchised, uh, sometimes troubled young people who are looking for some sense of identity, arguably, something to hang on to, something to some belonging. Um, you know, there's no simple answer to that. But where are we going wrong? Is, is, is it, does it come back to that bit that you were talking right at the very early uh, part of the, of the of the podcast around around community and around compassion and engagement and you know many of the things that the Joe Cox Foundation certainly started out very much focusing on. Absolutely, I would agree. I think prevention and early intervention are the keys to so many different subjects, whether that's around health and well-being, which is a piece of work that I'm doing at the moment, but certainly whether that's around. Uh, young people being drawn into bad behaviours, whether that's within the criminal justice system, starting with antisocial behaviour, or whether that is being drawn towards extremism. And I think you're right. I think the, the, the words that you've used there, that sense of identity, that sense of belonging, we need communities that give every young person that sense of identity and sense of belonging. Because if we don't, extremists will. And that's been shown time and time again. And I've worked with a, a number of organisations um, ex-right-wing extremists who talk about how that process happens and sometimes unfortunately they'll use something like sport and football um to give people that sense of identity and belonging and, and that that i find that really upsetting it's me really angry because for me with my background in sport sport is the answer to so many ills mm. that you know we, we get give kids um you know a, a sport or a, a, a recreational activity to get involved in that can be their salvation that can be the thing that, that gets them out of of trouble i was at a boxing gym at the weekend and the guy who runs that is absolutely amazing and he does loads of really good work with local kids who could easily go down the wrong path um so i think that prevention piece is really important because if you're happy in your life and you're feeling good and you're feeling like you've got a future you don't want to get involved in bad behaviors and equally you also have a much more positive um relationship in terms of your mental health and well-being because you know, there's kids in my constituency, Batley and Spen, and across the whole country who will reach a junction in their life when they've got choices to make. And those choices could take them down a very different path. And we're talking about things like knife crime, antisocial behaviour, extremism. Um, and while ever we have got communities that are nurturing our young people, schools obviously are part important part of that but also making sure that families who are struggling are well supported um so there's lots of different dimensions to it and i think unfortunately without getting into the politics of it we're not seeing much leadership in that regard at the moment we're not looking at that community building piece of work we don't invest properly in things like you know the the, the sport and leisure sector where we can provide those opportunities for young people to get into positive behaviors you know grassroots sports for me is an obvious one whether that's rugby league, football, boxing, cricket, whatever it is, getting children into positive behaviours. Um, so I think I would always go on prevention, but then early intervention as well. And looking, you know, I spend a lot of time visiting primary schools. You can tell who the vulnerable children are at a very early age. And that early intervention by an appropriate level of services. And again, unfortunately, we've seen a huge amount of cutbacks on youth services in the last decade. So how can we build those services up again so that those kids can be scooped up when they are vulnerable so last easy question then or two easy questions one is how do we rebuild trust in politics oh my gosh easy question i'll tell you why i'll tell you why i asked that because I, I noticed that i saw a press release today that Theresa may is publishing a book about this very subject which i thought was slightly ironic if i'm honest but we're not going to get into the politics um but it seems to me you know the greatest threat to our democracy is probably the lack of trust in our politicians and the lack of belief in them. And therefore, why would I bother voting for you? Because you're not going to do what you say you're going to do. So, you know, come on, what's the simple answer to this then? There's no, <laughs> there's no one thing. There, there's different layers to this. One first thing is we need to look at our behaviour. Now that I am a politician, even though that sounds still sounds a bit weird, how do I behave? What standards do I uphold? And all MPs have got to do that. We've got seven principles of public life, things like honesty and integrity and leadership and things like that. We need to be looking at those every day and thinking, am I doing this? Am I upholding these standards? Um, we also need to be looking at, again, the type of people that we bring into politics. And part of that is about having a, be- a better culture within politics to attract the right sorts of people. Um, it's, it's also, I guess... <laughs> Trying to create a political culture where we are allowed to be a bit more honest and open about maybe the things that we don't know. 
because that, that there's various reasons why I said I'd never get involved in politics. One was because you're never allowed to say you don't know. Mm. And actually, the reality is we all say that mm. day in and day out. Oh, I'm not sure, but I'll find out. Mm. Or, I'm not sure. Let me find, do a bit of research. Let me find out a bit more about that subject. You're not allowed to change your mind. Mm. And therefore, that's why you end up with a lot of this fudging of questions. You know, because, yeah, yeah. because you, yeah. know, so, you know, actually, five years ago, that, that probably was the right thing. But now I'm not sure it is. Yep. And that's why I want to revisit it. You're kind of not allowed to do that. So it's that political culture of you know we are human beings so some of some of that's about expectations though from the public of what we want our politicians to be like we want you to be more honest we want you so therefore we have to be more forgiving of you when you do change your mind or when you do get something you know you get a stat wrong or you get you know you say something that isn't necessarily aligned with your leadership but that's because you have a slightly different view on it yeah yeah and i think i think that should be allowed you know i I think yeah you're right i think people should be a bit more understanding about that um, but these are big cultural changes, you know. Um, I think we should focus again more on common ground. I think what we should also do, actually, is make sure that people are aware that politics and Westminster is not just about that half an hour on a Wednesday lunchtime where we have PMQs and people stand and shout at each other, which for most MPs is the most frustrating time of the week because that is not representative of what goes on in Parliament. We've got fantastic select committees, which are on a cross-party basis. We've got fantastic all-party parliamentary groups, which work on a cross-party basis. We've got good friendships across party lines. And that's where a lot of the magic happens and a lot of the really good work is done. So that 30 minutes of combat every week, I think is incredibly unhelpful, where no one answers the questions anyway, so what's the point? (laughs) And it's very aggressive. So I think there's so much that we could change about politics. The other big thing for me, actually, is political education. So we should be teaching young people about how the country is run, what it all looks like, what MPs do, what councils do, who makes the decisions that affect their lives. They then might be a bit more engaged. They might then turn out to vote because voter turnout is really poor. In my by-election, it was 47% and everybody celebrated how great that was. And I said, that's rubbish. That means 53% of people haven't voted. You can't blame them. They don't feel interested. They don't feel engaged. It's our responsibility to try and engage them in the system. Um, Because if you don't feel that you're part of the system, then why would you bother? I don't blame people at all. Um, So I think we've got responsibility to try and deal with that as well. Um, So there's lots of different layers to it. The media should cover some of the more positive stories around politics, not just the stuff where people are shouting and screaming at each other. The 650 MPs, and I bet most people could probably name 20. Mm. And they'll probably be the most controversial 20. They'll be the ones who are always doing the the bad stuff or the the not so good stuff and actually there's another 630 MPs who are working the socks off day in and day out to try and help people in their constituencies uh, and to try and make a difference but that doesn't get covered because it's not quite as exciting. And one last question then Kim, would there there be one thing that would make you feel safer? Gosh, well I guess the one thing but it is a big thing is that change of culture. It's just a change of culture around focusing, I guess, you know, as my sister said, on the things that we have in common rather than the things that divide us. And that's not just in politics. I think that's in society more generally, just reconnecting on a human level and being a bit more understanding about other people's lives. Well, I think that's a brilliant way to end this podcast because that's probably the best message there could be, isn't it? Thank you. Well, no, Kim, thank you. It's been, and it's always, you know, I can always chat to you forever. So it's uh, it's, it's brilliant. And, and thank you for doing this. I know how busy you are. So to take an hour out of your day is um, it is wonderful. So, you know, Kim, thank you so much for giving us a, an insight into what it actually is like to be a politician in the 21st century. No, thank you, Phil. And thank you for all the work that you do. And yeah, I'm probably not a typical politician, but I'm not quite sure what one of those is. Well, Obviously. maybe we need more like you then, perhaps. That's that's probably what many, many people will be, will be thinking when they've listened to this, hopefully. But anyway, we're not going to go on that thing because we'll be here all night. But uh, Kim, thanks very much again. Cheers. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Online Bodyguard podcast with host Philip Grindel, CEO and founder of Diffuse. Please rate, review and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platforms.